So for me growing up, I, I saw how elected officials could use their power to hurt or harm communities. And that definitely informed the way I saw the necessity to be engaged in the political process. Hello, and welcome to Meet Your Alderman, a podcast that aims to inform Chicago residents about the people who represent them. I'm your host, Eric Eber, wondering if snow before Christmas is even a thing anymore, and I'm joined not by Sarah Scott, but by Jeff. Jeff, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jeff Biddle, and I am a new host for Meet Your Alderman, a first-year master's student from Southeast Missouri, letting you know that snow before Christmas is an absolute luxury. It was 60 degrees on Christmas last year. Eric and I spoke to Alderman Carlos Ramirez Rosa of the 35th Ward, which covers a broad swath of the city's northwest side, including parts of Hermosa, Logan Square, Avondale, Irving Park, and Albany Park. It is one of the city's most diverse wards, with large immigrant and first-generation American populations. Alderman Rosa, the child of immigrants from Puerto Rico and Mexico, is the youngest of the 50 currently serving aldermen. He grew up in the city and worked as an organizer before choosing to run for alderman himself in 2015. In that race, he defeated Ray Colon with the vision of empowering working families and marginalized groups in the ward. A member of the Democratic Socialists of America, an Illinois vice chair for Bernie Sanders' 2020 presidential campaign, and the former chair of the council's Socialist Caucus, Alderman Rosa is one of the key members of the council's left flank. We covered a lot in our conversation with the aldermen, including the city's support for immigrant populations, police accountability, recent dynamics between the mayor and the council, and how to make democracy as active and inclusive a process as possible. As always, check the show notes for more information about the 35th Ward and enjoy listening. Thank you for joining us, taking the time out of your busy day. We've heard a lot about you in our past episodes or the work that you've done, so it's great to finally see you in person-ish. This might be a good place to start. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Lakeview. My parents purchased in Lakeview in 1974 when it was still primarily a working class and immigrant neighborhood. As you all may know, Lincoln Park was the first neighborhood in Chicago to be targeted for gentrification and then uh, after Lincoln Park uh, came Lakeview. Um, but my parents fought in Lakeview prior to gentrification. That's where I grew up. So how did your upbringing shape your current political views? Well, I grew up um, with a Puerto Rican father and a Mexican mother. They came of age in the late 60s and early 70s uh, during the Black Power Movement, the Brown Power Movement. And they were keenly focused on making sure that people of color had equal opportunity, that we were dismantling both de jure and de facto racism. And I also grew up closeted. I was um, an am a gay man. I think coming from both an immigrant family background, a Latine background, and a gay background really made me understand that there are people in power and that those people in power can use their power to either harm you or to help you live a full and dignified life. The two examples that I can think of are when Republicans were running and winning elections, attacking marriage equality in the early 2000s. Um, That was something where I saw how Republicans talking about marriage equality and coming out against marriage equality led to the attitudes of my classmates being oriented towards uh, homophobia and discrimination. And then I saw Republicans and right-wing politicians attacking immigrant families in 2006 with H.R. 4437, uh, the Sensenburner burner bill, where Republicans in the House were prepared to criminalize the act of being undocumented in this country and criminalize the act of helping someone that was undocumented in this country. So if you provided a water bottle or clothing or housing to someone who was undocumented in this country, you yourself could uh, face criminal liability. So for me growing up, I I saw how elected officials could use their power to hurt or harm communities. And that definitely informed the way I saw the necessity to be engaged in the political process. So did that eventually bring you to the Democratic Socialist Party? Like, when did you come into the Democratic Socialist Party? Yeah, so uh, the Democratic Socialist Party of America are not a party, although many members aspire uh, for it to be a party one day. 
I came more broadly to democratic socialism through research and study. So yes, my life experiences, you know, being the son of, of union members, the grandson of union members, seeing my own family's experience. My Puerto Rican family grew up cutting sugarcane, never had union representation. Many of them are still living in poverty. My Mexican-American family came to the U.S. and worked as unionized steel mill workers. And that unionized steel mill job gave them the opportunity to send their kids to Catholic schools, go on vacation, buy a car, live a more dignified life. So for me growing up, I saw the role that unions played, right? And I saw how when working class people come together, make demands for better pay, better benefits, that that leads to a higher quality of life. So for me, kind of just having that class analysis from a very young age uh, led me to understand that working class people need to come together and need to fight for the things that they need to survive and thrive. And uh, reading individuals like Noam Chomsky in high school, reading Marx, studying you know social movements, both uh, in the U.S. and the Western Hemisphere and across the globe, that's what led me to democratic socialism. So then what brought you then to the 35th Award? Uh, shortly after graduating from the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign, I moved back up to Chicago. I got a job working in the office of Congressman Luis Gutierrez, who was a co- member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, uh, was the national champion on immigration reform. And his office in the 4th Congressional District was located in Humble Park at the intersection of North Avenue and Kedzie. So I was looking for a place to live that was near my family in Lakeview and which was near my job. And so I ended up not too far away from Belmont and Kedzie and uh, was in the Avondale community in the 35th Ward. And I began to see how the older person at that time, Ray Cologne, was using his power to advance the interests of rich and powerful moneyed interests, was voting with the mayor to support the closure of schools, to support the closure of mental health clinics, was using his power over local zoning uh, zoning and land use decisions to advance the interests of deep-pocketed campaign contributors uh, and a number of particular big developers and big landlords. And I wanted to get involved in the community and and fight back against displacement, fight back against the moneyed interests who had an interest at odds with the public interest. Yeah, you, you touched on just a lot of great stuff that we definitely want to dig into further. But first, I just want you to fill in the blank. The 35th Ward is blank. How can you sum up your ward as concisely as possible? Yeah, the 35th Ward is diverse. It is a community of people from all across the globe, from all across the Midwest. In terms of the city of Chicago, unfortunately, we have an ugly history of segregation. We're one of the most segregated major American cities in the world. And 35th Ward, I think, is an example in the opposite direction of a community that has more integration, more immigrant families, more migrant families from all different parts of the globe and our country coming together and creating home. So you draw a sharp contrast to your predecessor, who you defeated, right? I did. So I was very upset about the direction that the city of Chicago was heading in in 2014. I started asking folks who's going to run against Ray Cologne. He was the incumbent alderman. He had been there for 12 years at that point. The local state senator at that time, a man named Willie Delgado, I heard that he was thinking about running. I reached out to him. I met with him. And he said, Carlos, I'm not going to run, but I think you should run. So Mm -hmm. I went back to my parents, like any good son, because I was 24, 25 years old at the time. And I I said, Mom, Dad, the local state senator said I should run. And they said, oh, honey, he probably says that to everyone. You don't know 10 people that can each donate $10,000 to you. Uh, There's just no way that you can win this race. And I believe them because they care about me, right? They love me. And I went back to my job. I was working at that point in time for the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. And as fate would have it, my job sent me to a week-long organizing training. And at that organizing training, they challenged me to be the change that I wanted to see in the world. They said, working class people, queer people, people of color, women consistently count themselves out. We create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so that week, I decided that I was going to run for office, um, that I was going to go back to my community. And if there was no acceptable progressive candidate putting together a coalition of people at the grassroots level to defeat the then incumbent, that I was going to do it with my neighbors uh, and with my family and with my friends. A month or two later, we launched a campaign for 35th Ward Alderperson. 
we knocked a ton of doors and we won that first race with 67% of the vote. Yeah, th that's incredible. And you're still the youngest serving alderman currently, correct? I am, yes. So that was elected when I was 26 years old. I had just turned 26 years old about a week prior uh, to the election. And seven and a half years later, I'm still the youngest alder person, which uh, just speaks to, you know, generally how old our legislative bodies are in this country. And that, that also something we want to talk about. But again, I just want to draw that contrast between you and your predecessor, namely in your efforts to really increase community engagement. Now, you're a big proponent of participatory democracy. So the first question is, how do you define participatory democracy? Yeah, I think, you know, in some ways it's uh, redundant because democracy should be participatory. But I, I think that for those of us who seek to practice or implement participatory democracy, adding the participatory in front of democracy is important because oftentimes people view democracy as something passive, right? It's something that every four years you go cast a vote, but really it's only people that are literate, right? That are U.S. citizens tend to vote. Um, and there's a huge portion of the population that does not vote. So participatory democracy seeks to make something that we do every single day, right? It, it's something that we seek to do in our communities to show that, you know, we don't need the rich and powerful telling us what to do, that we collectively at the local level can come together to make the decisions that are going to impact our lives. That by coming together and building mutual aid networks, by coming together and making local decisions around budgeting or zoning and land use or the governance of our schools or local policies, that we can actually create the type of world that we want to see here and now. Specifically in the 35th Ward, we've taken the things that aldermen control unilaterally. So, for example, aldermen control zoning and land use. Um, now, that's not written into city code. City code says that the city council must vote on zoning map amendments, but we have a system of member deference, what we call aldermanic prerogative in the city of Chicago, where I'm not going to tell uh, you know, the alderman of the 50th Ward what to do in her ward, and she's not going to tell me what to do in my ward when it comes to local zoning and land use decisions. So, effectively, the alderman controls all zoning and land use uh, decisions impacting solely their board. And this has gotten some aldermen in trouble. In some instances, they collect campaign contributions. In other instances, uh, they directly you know, take bribes. In the 35th Ward, we've sought to combat that by democratizing that process and creating a participatory planning process, where when there is a zoning map amendment, we ask local community groups, we ask organizations that are led by neighbors, we ask them their thoughts. We ask them to provide feedback. We have them work directly with the developer. Oftentimes, the community groups ask for community benefits agreements. Um, those community benefits agreements have led to agreements where we ask the developer uh, and the operator to pay more than the minimum wage to their employees. Uh, other times, it's led to benefits for local parks. But what we do is we make sure that uh, the community has a real say over what that local zoning and land use looks like. And after a period of negotiation between community groups that represent the, the residents of the community and the developer, we move forward to a community assembly or a community meeting. Yeah, another thing I'd like to ask you about is participatory budgeting. Uh, your ward exercises that. I, I noticed in 2021, there were about 805 votes for the projects that were up which is about 2% of the ward population. Do you have any goals in increasing the voter turnout there? Or do you think it's more of the fact that any community engagement is better than no community engagement? Yeah. So I think, one, any community engagement is better than no community engagement. Two, it's about creating the opportunities and building the table. People who feel they need to be at that table will show up and making sure that you're making it as accessible and inclusive as possible. So removing the barriers to participation. If we only view democracy as something we do in the ballot box every four years, that's a failure. Yes, more people vote in the local aldermanic election than vote in a participatory budgeting election. But in participatory budgeting, people that are 14 years old can participate. Undocumented immigrants can participate. The level of engagement, it's much more robust than just walking into a voting booth and touching a button. We're actually educating people about the way in which government functions. We have working class moms um, who don't have a college degree, oftentimes don't even have a high school diploma, who are now experts on uh, infrastructure and how the city of Chicago uh, you know, builds a new playground. For me, there, there are certain things that are difficult to measure, but are extremely important that go beyond just the total number of people that are participating. Um, and I, I'm really proud of the fact that 
in communities throughout the 35th Ward, thanks to our participatory budgeting process, we have seen infrastructure uh, improvements in communities that have not seen that level of investment in decades. When I took office in communities that were heavily undocumented and immigrant, you had streets that had not been touched by the city in decades. Mm -hmm. um, and so what does that mean, right? The, the alderman was going off of, in my ward, if you want to see your street resurface, then you need to come out and vote. They don't mean come out and vote in a participatory budgeting process. They literally mean you have to show up to the election, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a quid pro quo. There's not 10 voters on that block. That alderman feels like they're not going to invest uh, their limited infrastructure dollars in resurfacing that street or making pedestrian safety improvements. Um, so that's inequitable. That's unjust. It's not good public policy. It's not good government. So through participatory budgeting, we demystify how it is that these dollars are allocated. People can rest assured that if one street's being resurfaced as opposed to another, it's not because the alderman's friend is on one street and not on the other. It's not because one street has more affluent, uh, likely voters and the other street is mostly, you know, working class immigrant and undocumented immigrant uh, residents. Uh, they can know that there was an actual inclusive, democratic and transparent process. So you've mentioned a few times already immigrants, particularly those without status. My question is, what do you think the city should be doing more or better with regards to this population? More specifically, what do you think that the Committee on Immigrant and Refugee Rights should be doing? Do you think that they're being effective? Yeah. Well, I advocated for the creation of a Committee of Immigrant and Refugee Rights. Mm -hmm. I think that the way in which it was implemented was a classic example of the mayor buying votes, engaging in a quid pro quo. She had removed Alderman Ariel Raboyras from his committee chairmanship because of his ties to Ed Burke. But then he's a loyalist. He votes with the mayor 100% of the time. And so she created this committee to reward him, to provide him with additional jobs so that he then felt like he had gotten something for being this loyal uh, mayoral stalwart. We should have a committee on immigrant refugee rights, but it should be an actual committee that's empowered to lead a policy that integrates and protects the city of Chicago's sizable undocumented immigrant and immigrant community, which hails from all across the globe. A couple of things the committee could do is one, meet. Um, that would definitely help. Two, I think hiring competent staff there are so many people in Chicago, in Illinois, and across the globe who have tremendous expertise when it comes to local municipal policy on integrating and protecting immigrant populations. Uh, I wish that some of them were working for the Immigrant and Refugee Rights Committee. But in terms of what the city can do policy-wise, I think first and foremost, listen to communities that are directly impacted. When I first took office, I leveraged my relationships in the undocumented immigrant community, in the immigrant and refugee rights community, to create the Chicago Immigration Policy Working Group. That was the first of its kind working group. In the past, we had only seen working groups created by the mayor's office. So this was the first time that we actually had a group of aldermen, without the permission of the mayor, creating a working group. We also brought together uh, the broad spectrum of immigrant communities in the city of Chicago. And we asked them, what can the city do to be the most immigrant-friendly city in the world? Because that's what Mayor Rahm Emanuel had set out as a goal. And we did our research and we came up with a policy paper that outlined six policy proposals that we thought the city of Chicago could implement. The most important one was removing the carve-outs from the welcoming city ordinance to make sure that in no instance could uh, local police uh, work with ICE to deport individuals? And we felt that was very important so that one, immigrant communities were not afraid to call 911, and that could help repair relationships between immigrant communities and the police. Uh, and two, we thought it was extremely important to protect our immigrant families from separation and deportation. So as of today, I believe all of the original six policies that we asked for have been implemented to in integrate and protect immigrants. I think moving forward, we need to really resuscitate the Office of New Americans. Mm -hmm. The Office of New Americans under Mayor Rahm Emanuel um, had three staff. It is down to one staffer, and they really have no policymaking authority. They really have no funding. So I think that providing them with resources so that they can support work to welcome and integrate immigrants would be extremely important, and then providing them with additional staffing. So to change topics a little bit, uh, another topic you've been a fundamental player in is police accountability. And you are the chief sponsor of CPAC Ordinance, or the Civilian Police Accountability Council. So 
looking at the status of the ECPS or the Empowering Communities for Public Safety Ordinance, how does that compare to your vision for police accountability and oversight? Yeah, so the demand for community control of the police starts with the Black Panthers Party. But it's been a demand that's been around for a very long time to have democratic community control over the ways in which our communities are policed, over the resources that are being allocated towards policing, and the ways in which the police operate and interact with the public in our neighborhoods. The current iteration of this demand came from the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, specifically victims of police violence, uh, victims of police torture. And Chicago has a very ugly history of police torture and police violence and police misconduct. Victims of this police misconduct and violence, particularly in the wake of the murder of Laquan McDonald, demanded community control of the police. And they authored a piece of legislation known as the Civilian Police Accountability Council. And what it sought to do was it sought to replace the police board, it sought to replace the existing structures that govern the police, and bring in a democratically elected body to oversee the Chicago Police Department directly. Now, you may say, well, doesn't the city council oversee the Chicago Police Department? Yes and no. One, the mayor primarily directs the Chicago Police Department. Two, the city of Chicago has failed to provide oversight of CPD pretty consistently. And three, the notion was to bring in even more democracy, right? To have even more individuals that could be held accountable. So after the introduction of this ordinance, a number of nonprofit groups came together and formed a similar but competing proposal that was called the Grassroots Alliance for Political Accountability, GAPA. Both of these coalitions started to push for the implementation of their ordinance. Mayor Lightfoot ran on a commitment to, she supported uh, the GAPA proposal. And then once she took office, she walked that back and said, no, I don't want to implement that. And so in the face of Mayor Lightfoot's opposition, in the face of some legal challenges, primarily the fact that there were some elements of CPAC that could not be implemented as the law currently stipulates, we married the GAPA proposal with the CPAC proposal, and that became Empowering Communities for Public Safety. So we fought uh, very, very hard uh, to pass that ordinance. I guess the, to make a long story short, we're working to implement the ordinance that we have. We know that this is a first step on the path to community control the police. So it's not ultimately where we would like to be, but it's much closer than where we were before. Yeah, and, and you've already mentioned a few of them, but Chicago actually has quite a few police oversight bodies. Whether they function properly is a different question, but that all comes down to a lot of acronyms, a, a lot, and a lot of ordinances and resolutions and organizations. For an ordinary citizen who is really in need, how, how do you direct them? Where do you send them? I think that if you have had an interaction with the Chicago Police Department and you feel that you were treated unfairly, you know, perhaps this may even rise to the level of a crime, um, you should call 312-746-3609 and reach out to the Civilian Office of Police Accountability. COPA is staffed with competent, compassionate legal professionals they know what to do with your case. They will investigate your case. They will look into what transpired uh, and recommend what action, disciplinary action, perhaps even legal action should be taken. Got it. No, we're going to be sure to include that in the show notes. The news recently has highlighted how the mayor's relationship to the council has changed. So what are your thoughts on the current power dynamics between the mayor and the city council? And how do you think they've changed over the course of this administration? The arrangement that has existed for 50 plus years in the Chicago City Council is that the mayor controls citywide policy, the mayor controls the budget, and the aldermen show up once a month, rubber stamp what the mayor puts before them, and in exchange, they get a lot of control over what happens locally in their wards. So the, the council kind of has really abdicated its role over controlling the city's budget, over really being the source of power, elected power at City Hall. And many of my colleagues don't even know what that would begin to look like. They have no <laughs> clue or interest in, in governing or, or leading in that way. They'd rather just maintain this relationship where uh, they vote on whatever the mayor puts in front of them, and in turn, uh, they have the mayor's support to implement their policy locally in their ward. 
Uh, that seemingly worked fine when there was a lot more federal government largesse and there was a lot more federal funds coming to the city. Daly borrowed a lot of money to be able to continue to provide his loyal older people with parks and, uh, you know, other things that they could then turn to and say, look at what we've delivered for our neighborhood. I think that Rahm reduced the amount of, like, carrots that he would give to his loyalists. There was this sense that he was the leader of a team. You know, if you got in trouble, could provide you with political funds to save you. And in terms of when I said there was a sense amongst aldermen that Ram was competent and that they were part of a team, I'm speaking to the, like, you know, traditional rubber stamp alder people. So I think that under Mayor Lightfoot, the basis of that transactional relationship has begun to fall apart. And so there's some older people that are just like, well, I'm not going to get anything from her, right? Like if I give her my votes, I can't count on getting a park. So I think there's a sense that like Mayor Lightfoot and her team uh, are just not going to deliver on the things that they need uh, to be able to justify why they're a rubber stamp. I think also the level of criticism, both rightfully and wrongly that the mayor has received, leads people to believe, well, I may not want to be associated with the mayor. And so that traditional relationship that existed between the rubber stamp alderman and the mayor has begun to fall apart. And I think that in the absence of that powerful mayor that a lot of aldermen just kind of gravitate to and follow, you've begun to see the expression of more differing worldviews in the council. So now we have a more like, you know, conservative faction in the council, and we have a more progressive you know, grouping in the council. Um, and then we have people that are kind of, you know, more traditional neoliberal moderates. And so you're beginning to see more of that expression in city council, whereas before you had people that described themselves as progressives, such as Amaya Pawar, people who are Trump voters like uh, Nicholas Passato and, you know, more moderate neoliberal folks like Tom Tunney, they all were on team uh, Rahm Emanuel, right? Because his ability to organize, to use his carrots and his sticks to bring people together around his hard, hard agenda, but his ability to bring people around that using money, using the influence of the office, led to a, a different type of relationship between the mayor and the council that is now beginning to fall apart. That's so, my theory. That's my analysis. So we have this class of rubber stamp aldermen, as you said. We also have a large group who are opting to exit the council at the end of their current terms. Do you think that the changes are the most likely reason that's causing that exodus. Yeah, I think, well, one, we've all been through the trauma of the pandemic. We've lost loved ones. It's changed the way that we work. I can see that there's been a difference in terms of the types of complaints uh, and interactions with the public that our office has. You know, being in a community where there's uh, a lot of gentrification, we saw people who they lost so many of their family members, right? That they were in very precarious situations, that they're at risk of losing their housing. So, so I think that one, you know, there's a general trend of people leaving their jobs, deciding, I don't really like this, I want to try something else, kind of reassessing where they're at in their life. But I also think that it does have to do a lot with kind of the disintegration of the status quo. Before you could be an alderman and, you know, you would feel powerful, right? You would go and give your votes to the mayor, but then you could go back in your district and you would control all the local land use and zoning decisions. And then you'd partner with the mayor and you'd cut, get to cut the ribbon on a new library. You'd get to cut the ribbon on a new playground. For a lot of the old timers in the city council, that doesn't exist anymore. And so the council that they knew, the world in which they knew how to operate is just not there anymore. And so some of them have even said, this isn't fun anymore. This isn't enjoyable anymore. I also think, and, and my colleague, all the women, Rosana Rodriguez of the 33rd Ward, you know, points to this, there is a new crop of socialists and progressive alders who approach governance differently, right? And say, we're going to go in there, we're going to propose public policy, we're going to develop levels of expertise around certain areas of city policy, and we're going to push for that. And we're going to push for that within the halls of power, we're going to push for that publicly with allies on the ground, and that's created a lot more pressure. I think particularly on certain aldermen to kind of reassess the way in which they approach governance. Because in my district, there are a lot of people that pay attention to public policy. I'm certain that in the 46th ward, in the 48th ward, where you see James Kappelman and Harry Osterman retiring, I'm sure they have a lot of constituents there that are like, why aren't you more like Matt Martin? Why aren't you more like, uh, you know, Rosana Rodriguez? Why aren't you more like, you know, some of these other alders that we've seen fighting for progressive policy? And so I think it raises expectations on them. And 
with all of that, it creates this perfect storm where they're just like, it's time for me to go. Yeah, that hinted at something I wanted to ask you about. Do you think that there has been a cultural change, not only in city council, but in the electorate as well? Do you think that the voters are moving away from wanting that traditional alderman who makes sure that trash gets picked up and make sure that they know that there's someone that they can talk to if they have problems with their sidewalk or other little infrastructure, things like that. Do you think they're moving away from that and more towards the alderman who cares about the city at large, that follows council legislation carefully? Do you think this is a real trend or no? I, I think it's a real trend that's happening. I think it's happening in certain neighborhoods more than others. I can tell you that my first term in office, uh, working alongside all and Scott Wagaspeck, a lot of alders would tell me, we don't understand why you and Scott Wagaspeck talk so much about citywide policy. <laughs> like, well, one, it's because I feel like I was elected to worry about that and care about that. But two, it's because my constituents have that expectation of me. They're coming to me and asking me, you know, what are my stances on these ordinances? They're coming and proposing citywide legislation to me. In my district, I also think it's a generational divide. You know, I have Chicagoans that have lived in the 35th Ward since before the Kennedy Expressway was built. Wow. And they come to me and they say, the only thing that I care about, Alderman, is that the garbage is picked up and that the potholes are filled and you're doing a good job on that. So even though you're this crazy socialist, you're good in my book. Um, and then I have constituents that come to me and are like, what are you doing about climate change? Right. And like, come to me with graphs and charts <laughs> like, you know, I need to talk to you about this and you need to be competent and you need to understand the things that I'm uh, asking you about. A lot of topics we've covered are some of the more contentious public policy issues that have come before the council. Another one could be this idea of an independent commission for ward redistricting. Would you support that kind of commission? And if so, how can the commission best be designed so as to minimize the influence of the mayor and the city council over the process? I do support an independent commission. That is something that we would need Springfield to help us with. And it's going to be challenging. We have uh, nine years until the next census or no, a little less than that, eight or so. But um, I, I think that we absolutely do need to be moving in that direction. I definitely uh, need to give that more thought in terms of what are best practices from other municipalities. Uh, how have they structured that in a way that's meaningful? I think just some initial thoughts. It needs to be diverse. It needs to represent the diversity of our city. There needs to be some mechanisms to ensure that it's truly independent. I suspect that the council would be loath to give up his power. Uh, actually, I know that it would be. So I think that there has to still be some role for the city council. My initial thought is the commission draws up a proposal. The Independent Redistricting Commission draws up a proposal. Uh, they have public meetings. They ask the public to respond to that proposal. They make adjustments to the proposal. Then they send it to the council. And the council then has to, you know, respond to the proposal and, and work on that proposal. So ultimately, you know, the council has a say on the, the final version of the map. So I, I definitely am keen. We do have some years to figure this out, but but yeah, I am keen to kind of figure out what our best practices uh, to make sure we have a really good independent process for redistricting as we approach the next census. Alderman Rosa, thank you so much for that incredible insight. Before we let you go, though, we have one last question that we haven't prepped you with, but that we ask all of our guests. Where is your favorite place to get non-deep dish pizza in the city? Non-deep dish pizza. So I grew up in Lakeview, and my parents leased to this man named uh, Martin, who opened up Chicago's Pizza. Uh, and if people grew up in Chicago, they would have remembered ads, mostly on cable, where like these two guys, they like go out of Wrigleyville, and then they like fall asleep. And then someone's ringing their doorbell at 5 a.m., and they're freaking out. And it's the Chicago's Pizza delivery guy. So like most Chicagoans, I go to the pizza that I grew up on. And I grew up on Chicago's Pizza. There's a location on Lincoln Avenue, and there's a location on Irving Park near Cicero. So it's definitely a north side, northwest side thing. Um, you know, it's not everyone's favorite pizza, but it's it's the pizza that I grew up on. And so I'm going to stick with by it. Alderman Rosa, thank you again for being so generous with your time. It has been truly an honor getting the opportunity to pick your brain a bit, learn more about you and your ward, as well as about the inner workings of the council. 
And before I forget, I'm just going to shout out the number again for Culpa. That's 312-746-3609. Thanks for listening. This episode was hosted by myself and Jeff Biddle. Editing was done by Kristen Karanen, Sarah Scott, and Hannah Burnick. Graphic design was done by Olivia Dupriel. And Harrison Lee does our sound engineering. Be sure to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is TweetYourAlderman. That's your spelled U-R. That's all for now. See you next time.